So a little bit of intros first of all, um, although really um, my two colleagues here don't need a great deal of introduction, it's fantastic to be joined by Asantha, our CEO here at Paysource, um, by his own admission, the old man of payroll apparently. Um, and also Lee, my friend Lee, who I've been getting to know over the last 10 months of being here at Paysource, um, but her partnership with Paysource goes back a lot longer. Number eight HR have been a really important part of Paysource's journey. Um, and so uh, it's awesome to have her here talking about this topic too. And um, we've done some webinars together before and had lots of fun. So looking forward to this one as well. Um, my name's Mary Claire. I'm currently the head of sales and marketing here at Paysource. Um, uh, before this, I've been working with other companies in growth roles and had my own uh, software startups and specialized manufacturing startups, which I grew to. So I'm actually going to tell some stories from um, those experiences, Asantha from our Paysource experiences and um, Lee covering the massively long career that she's had despite her youthful looks. Well done. Um, well done. Like the way you got that and Marie Claire. Thank waiting. you. I appreciate it. So we're, um, we're talking about being a better boss here today and we're actually going to go on something of a journey from, and, and I guess the word boss is the key bit here, right? This is, it obviously implies employees or people. So we're talking about that partnership that is so critical to successful business between you as a boss and your employees, you as a leader and your people. Um, and the, the theme really is that it starts really early on, even bef obviously before you have a vacancy and it carries on through the importance of that relationship all the way through to when they come through the door, when they're sitting in their seat, and even afterwards when ultimately they've moved to another organization. So we're going through that journey. I'm going to start it off um, talking a bit about the employer branding concepts, given that I'm the marketing geek in the room. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Lee, who'll pick up from that critical moment when there is a vacancy and talking about systems and tools and processes to really nail that and hopefully segue beautifully uh, to Asantha who will then pick up with some case studies and stories um, you know about culture and building teams and, and what happens as, as organizations grow and change. So that's the plan as I said please do ask us some questions um, but I will get straight into it. So um, the reason that I wanted to kick off and sort of start this story is, as a marketer, I think about um, marketing funnels all the time. I'm thinking about talking to an audience, which is actually our customers, and I'm thinking about making them aware of our business. I'm thinking about how do they consider it? How do they then convert to a customer? And then how do they become loyal and customers and ultimately advocates for us? So that's our classic marketing funnel that I work with in any of your teams who are in marketing will be working with too. But it applies just as equally to this other group, this other customer group, which is your employees, your people. Mm. Um, you need to be thinking about that funnel all of the time, pretty much from the moment you open your doors, thinking about creating awareness of your business and helping people ultimately walk through the front door naturally. Um, and I'll explain to you why that's really important. So Employer branding is about building your reputation as an employer of choice. It's the promise that you make, just like other brand promises. So um, you would never dream of trying to sell a service that you don't deliver. You would never dream of trying to sell a product that you don't make. It's about congruence. You're not going to sell an experience for people to join you that doesn't exist. So um, you have to be thinking about what those values are and what your business truly is in terms of that essence from day one so that then you can go and represent that out um, to to the marketplace um, just like marketing there are different channels and different messages you would use depending on where you are in that conversation with your people so depending whether you're starting out whether you've got a moment in time where you're growing your team whether there are changes in your team um, and even actually just around retention and keeping your team so I'll talk a bit about those different options as well but the main thing I wanted to explain is it's not shouldn't be employer branding shouldn't be a separate activity it's not something you need to do separately you actually should be trying to think of ways to represent those values that you have and to reach those employees through all of the other communications that you do um, the goal ultimately is to create affinity so that's why i pop this slide up here about this must be the place it's helping people understand that um, 
and to feel that where you work, the, the business you've created is their place, to feel that kind of connection. Um, and to do that, you've really got to have values aligned. So we'll talk about this quite a lot, but values are really critical to this process. I don't know, it sounds obviously values are super critical to us at Paysos. And if you wanted to jump in a bit on the setting values early piece is why it's so important in this. Absolutely. So um, what, what we did was we had a ground up process of working out what was important to the people who work here. What are the values that they hold dear? And, and, and that has now become the sort of cornerstone of the business. Um, so the, so it's really easy. Then we've got to make a decision. We just refer back and say, is this congruent with our values? And, and that has been a really useful tool. And, and this is from someone who has been pretty cynical about some of those things in the past. Uh, but seeing it actually work, um, I, I've become a, a great advocate for living your values and, and, and for those values to always be challenged and be relevant. Yeah. And um, it's not fluff. Like, Sometimes I know you might be thinking, oh, that's the marketing woman. That's all of that's just fluff. Honestly, it translates to um, bottom line. Um, it's, it's a very practical process. Um, LinkedIn's recent survey for job seekers suggested that 75% of people looking for work are actually considering the employer brand before they apply. Um, so it is really vital. And if you are able to do what I mentioned before, which is not think about recruitment and advertising as a completely discrete piece of work that requires separate investment, you can actually re reduce your costs per hire quite significantly. Again, that 50% figures from LinkedIn. Um, I don't know. Lee, if you've got any comments on that, do you think that sounds kind of reasonable if people are actually involving this employment branding conversation early that they may be able to reduce the costs? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a couple of things that you need to make sure you're doing when you're when you're scoping for people is that you need to have as broad an applicant pool as you can, but then the ones that filter through into, you know, those that you'll progress through that process, they need to be values aligned because otherwise you're actually wasting your time and their time. And uh, and I think sometimes we forget that applicants are time short as well as us and, uh, and we can actually use their time and that doesn't leave a good taste in their mouth. Uh, about your brand so yeah absolutely yeah um and this this comment about giving you access to top talent i guess this is um this is thinking really quite broadly about that awareness piece you know um you don't know who's looking you don't know who's seeing those stories you you know it's it's uh yeah there's there's a sense of serendipity in there um which you may not think where you know we may be based in a small town somewhere and you might not think you'd be able to access these people but you can if you're present in the places that they're looking essentially mm -hmm. um i quite like the fourth point here where it says brand matters more than money um i'm having a chat to some of my friends yesterday at a business summit i was at i asked them this question about their recent like what was the most the, the most important thing for their recent um career moves and they all all to a t and i promise i didn't see it um said that the values and the brand of the business they went to was the first thing they considered and they were after that, when they got into salary discussions and negotiations, they or they had already made a decision about it, actually. So it was that that mattered. A um, couple of them said they'd taken salary drops. It didn't matter. So even in this tight labor market where we kind of hearing all the time that employees can set their price, I think it's very true um, for many people that actually that brand alliance, that congruence, that sense of this is my place um, can be um, more important potentially than many. And then um, this last piece of uh, this last point here. Um, OK, back to the bottom line. Looking good as an employer influences your business brand, too. So your employer brand has a lovely knock on effect to the business brand, mm -hmm. which means getting more clients. Um, it creates a ripple effect, right? It's improving your reputation. It's improving your business brand, more customers, more profits. So definitely a good idea to be doing it. Um, this is a really good question to ask your teams at your next morning tea, next team meeting, um, just to get a sense of how strong the congruence might be and to give you some ideas for the storytelling you want to do out in the wider world about your brand. It's um, often accompanied by a good deal of pride or a complete lack of it. It's quite a useful test if you're brave enough to give it a whirl. And the answer pretty much explains the emphasis that a company's putting on its employer branding. So it's a really good test. Employees working with a business that's got a strong brand are often more engaged, more enthusiastic. 
um, because that brand doesn't just improve public perception, it also improves the perceptions of people who are working for it. So again, um, definitely something important to do for uh, for attention as well. So definitely, yeah, give it a go, try it at your next team meeting, or maybe send a short survey um, around to the team at work, see what happens. So it's gonna uh, jump into a few um, practical uh, examples here and using some of my stories here. So um, one of the companies I built a few years ago called Show Gizmo was in the software space. So apologies to those of you who are not tech businesses, I promise um, there are lots of um, parallels that we can draw here, but this was a software company. Uh, and the first thing we really understood um, and the advice we were given is that for a tech business, and especially in Wellington, um, our key hire was our CTO, our chief technology officer. Um, and that was what was considered basically that linchpin hire. So from having that right human in that role would ultimately help us with all of our other hires, with the business growth. And it was not wrong. It was actually as a result of a really good CTO, we were able to raise the millions we did in seed capital. So that mattered to us. But if you think about your own business, it may not be the CTO, but it may be there is an influencer in your company that you need to um, you need to secure or um, that might be sort of the answer to some of the expansion conversations that you need to have. Um, as a small company, actually the linchpin is you. So you're the person that, um, you're the key person there that is gonna be attracting other people. It's your values, it's the way you present yourself um, that's gonna matter to make those hires. For us, it was that CTO. Um, so we had to really think about demonstrating an employer brand that was gonna attract the right CTOs and then obviously as a tech business, the right developers. Um, turns out dogs are really important, hence the dog picture. This is Kaiser. Kaiser grew up with us from a puppy. Um, Kaiser appeared in many of our social media um, posts, in our stories. He had his own blog. Um, it, it was, it's a thing in the Wellington tech scene, so I'm not sure what your Kaiser might be, but we definitely needed him. So you can see bottom right corner, him relaxing on the couch with some of our engineers. The other thing that was important for our business um, turns out was sofas. So people wanted an environment that was congruent with the way they wanted to work, the way they physically wanted to work. Um, so here's me thinking as an employer, I needed to have the right money and probably the right kit. Um, but I also need to think about the physical space they were in and our engineers wanted to sit in their laps and have the dog next to them and code in teams like this. So we made sure we were telling those stories and using those visuals. It also needed to be a fun um, environment. So hence a lot of, uh, we were in the events industry. So um, many of our images were along these lines. And again, I'm conscious that as a marketer, and if you're not marketers, you might be thinking, well, gosh, she keeps talking about this content. I don't create content. I have people that do that for me, or, you know, that's that's just not something we're, we're working on. But Content is what you do out on the internet. It's the posts that you comment on. It's the comments you make. It's the events you turn up to. It's the clothes you wear at those events. All of those things are demonstrating your values as a business and as you as an employer. So you are making choices about the content that you put over to create that awareness for you as, as an employer. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Santa? Because I know yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's got to be authentic. Jumpers, yeah, right? <laughs> Pardon me? I'm thinking about the red jumpers we wear and the red, you know. The, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, 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 every time we go out, we, we are a brand ambassador, each of us, to whatever event we go to. And, and you know, that's why we pick the, the, the standout color. Um, you, you know when the, when the pace source people are in the room. Um, and the, the other piece that I'll add to that is it's got to be authentic. You can't have a a dog actor come in sort of, you know, for your pictures and then the, the dog disappears. It, it can't be that, it's, it's got to be real. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a, a critical thing for us is that are we authentic um, at, at all times? Yep. So um, just a few more stories thinking about those values. So the values we had at Show Gizmo were get shit done, have fun doing it and surprise and delight. Um, those really mattered to me and my founders. Um, so again, they came from us at the start. Um, that's how we created an atmosphere and a culture that we wanted to attract people to. Those were the driving elements for content we created, events we went to, all of those things as well. And just the way we managed to manifest those, just to give you some ideas, was 
when they get shit done, um, every person, every human had a delegated authority and ability to spend no matter how junior they were and clear decision-making authority. Turns out my Gen Zs loved that. Um, so they were able to just see a clear path to getting shit done. Um, so we always had great stories about what they had achieved themselves that we could then tell tell out in the out in the world. Have fun doing it. We actually um, used to celebrate failure. So mistake of the week, we used to just talk about mistakes as also just being essentially successes. We just made them. So um, we would celebrate those things. So could your weekly meetings perhaps include a focus on what you learned, not what results you get? So it's just trying to think about how to exemplify those those brand values. And then surprise and delight, which I'm sure many of you who've got a service element to your business will, will be having too. Um, for us, that was gifts for long-term customers. We'd have late night sessions as a team to, to ship a few small features that we'd never told anyone we were gonna do just to completely surprise people, take the team out for random unplanned lunches essential, essentially. But we we're trying to just shake up what was normal. Um, and you can think about that too. So if this is a value that resonates for you in your organization, maybe it's as simple as sending a letter instead of emails, picking up the phone instead of sending a letter. If it's quarterly formal reviews, try weekly show and tells. So, you know, how you can how you can shape those things up. So this is some of my um, bits of advice really about how to build an employer brand for those early stages of trying to engage with your people. So that kind of awareness and consideration, telling really congruent stories out to the market of potential people um, so that ultimately when you you have a, a vacancy that it's much more easy to fill. And that's my beautiful segue to you, Lee. Ta Thank you very much. Ta-da. And I love this graphic. Thanks for putting that in for me, Mary. Um, um, you know, look, um, and I've written down a mistake of the week. I'm, uh, I'm taking that one away, Mary Claire. I think that's an awesome way of, uh, of really embodying a learning environment without kind of using those really corporate learning environment words. Yeah. Like Often, often put people off. So, great, thank you. Um, yeah. So, look, if you're uh, if you're in the market, I just thought I'd give you a, a couple of tips around and um, around what we're seeing as a success criteria. So, the difference between clients who are, are getting good um, good applicants uh, numbers through and making good hires versus those who are perhaps struggling a little bit. Um, and, and a lot of recruitment is about having really good systems that sit in behind you so that you can, when you're having your conversations with the applicant, you can be forming that relationship with them because ultimately it's the relationship that you have with people and how well or how much they feel valued both pre and post employment that's going to keep them sticky to your business. Um, so if you've got a vacancy, um, first actions always speak much louder uh, than, uh, than your words. So it's important that when you take action, it's congruent, as Marie Claire and Asantha have both talked about. So Skype, scope widely in this, uh, in this uh, short market. Use your networks, um, social media, as well as your traditional portals like Speak. Uh, and make sure that you're shaping the job in a way that has the lens of your potential applicant over it. So if you're a small accounting practice in a rural town, then you might need to think differently about the kind of people that you might attract into your business versus being you know, a, a larger business in an in a, in a, in a, um, urban conurbation. So you just need to really think about who might come and work for you, how do you shape the job up, uh, in a way that actually works for them. So that could be job share, part-time work, flexible working arrangements, any of those kinds of things are all gonna help and contribute to you being able to attract people and, uh, and then make sure you're using your networks. Uh, we know that an extraordinary number of vacancies are actually filled through networks rather than through those traditional job portals. And that's something that just continues to climb as we see social media uh, coming more to the play. So people just connecting others through social media. Another thing that's super important in this particular um, in this particular uh, workforce um, shortage that we're having at the moment is you've got to be pacey, right? So um, if people flag any kind of interest in your business, you have to be there quickly and you have to relate. So you have to pick up the phone and speak to them quickly. You have to form that relationship early because if you're not doing it, somebody else is 
and that somebody else is going to feel like they're a better fit for that person. So you've got to get in front of them early and make those phone calls. And I know that that's really hard because we've all got day jobs and we all get pulled into the doing the doing and there's just another set of accounts to do. There's another you know strategy meeting to have with a client. But you've got to find time if you want to get good people into your business. You've got to find time and make time for for to to participate in that recruitment process. Uh, and then my third point here is just, you know, your tech does tell the story. So if you're, you know, talking about how you're, a, you know, uh, a really onto it business and you're well teched up and that, and then the first thing they get is please fill in a paper-based application form, you're not living the story that you're telling. So make sure, again, this talks to what Marie was saying earlier about being congruent, is that you've got to make sure that your process and your systems to recruit people are congruent with the experience they're going to have when they join your business and are congruent with the words that you're telling them when you're advertising. People smell bullshit at 100 paces, and that is the same as the case. I'm not sure if I'm going to say that pace or sorry, but um, it's the same as the as the case um, in terms of recruitment, is that, you know, you have to be authentic. Asantha keeps talking about that. If you're not authentic, if you're not your true self, right at the start of the process, then you're setting both your business and that potential person up for failure. Lee, we so have look, a quick question. Sorry, if you don't. Yeah. Um, in the fast moving recruitment landscape, how can we ensure the salary bands we're advertising are where they should be? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I, I just want to um I just want to deconstruct some of the rhetoric at the moment because I think that we're getting really caught up in the, you know, we have to pay more money, we have to keep, you know, salaries are moving, et cetera, et cetera. And and that is true. But sometimes I think that, you know, we look at that and we kind of, we're thinking in the quantum of like 20 or 30% salary movement, and, and that's not what we're seeing. So there's no doubt that at any point in time, you will have to adjust your remuneration for the skills and competencies of the people that are applying. But the quantum of shift, I think we're just getting a little bit ahead of, ahead of ourselves sometimes on what this needs to be. So couple of things about REM is so the first thing you have to be really clear about is what's your business's ability to pay because there's no point in uh, in taking out a salary that in six months time is going to actually prove to be um, you know a straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of the profitability of the business so you have to be really clear about your what you can afford um, and then I think you have to get, start to get really clear about asking applicants what they want and to go to your, your earlier point, what they want and what's most important to them. Because we too are seeing a lot of applicants move because of the kind of job that we can give people, the constructs around that in terms of the working arrangements or the opportunities that that might give. And we too are seeing people move, quality people move for less money if they can get some of those constructs right for themselves. So I think let's sort of, you know, just beware the headlines. They're not untrue, but let's beware of amplifying them to a point where they're actually unsustainable for our businesses. Um, so, you know, one of our standard questions when we sit in front of an applicant is to say to them, you know, what are your expectations and what are you basing that on? Because their kind of litmus test or their barometer in terms of their peer group that they're basing that on is really helpful to understand. And, and quite often people are, oh, well, what are you offering? And we're, you know, we're thinking in this sort of broad range, but it depends, you know, on, on I guess, the skills and experience and be really keen to see where you see yourself fitting in that range. And also never be afraid to ask the candidate, what are you currently earning? All right. So some people don't like asking, but I, I answer, answering it by I always ask it two or three times until I get that answer. And it's not because I'm going to constrain them to what they're currently earning, but it's because I really want to understand what the value proposition is that they're putting around themselves and how what they're currently earning pitches against what they they you know what they see as that wider market value expectation. So yeah, thanks, Mary Claire. There's a follow up actually. What's the most reliable way to stay up to date with agricultural packages on offer in our industry? So, when uh, we advertise, we're in the right ballpark. Yeah, I, I, good question. And um, oh, so, hmm, there's no easy answer to that because, as you know, uh, it is reasonably variable. And we know that the salary survey information that we get through, particularly in ag, 
uh, isn't 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 externally validated. So it's it's reliant upon what people input into it, and, and that's not validated information. So sometimes that can be a bit tricky. Um, so businesses actually like ourselves and PaySource have good databases because of the the the. The, the business that we're in. So um, you can always talk to either of our businesses to see what the, the, the pitch is locally. Um, but that would be my other tip is just ask around your network of, um, of local employers uh, and see what they're paying because they're probably your best sort of go to. And, uh, and in lots of our sectors, we're not, um, we're not competing um, too much in terms of, um, of um, stealing people locally. So, yep. Those would be my tips for that. Thank you. Do you cool. Want to let's go. Yeah, let's go to the next slide? slide. I feel like that slide took a long time, and I might be getting boring. Right. Okay. Um, so, what we need to be in terms of being a good boss when we're in that actual recruitment process is don't be naive. People are looking for what's in it for them. So just be clear that again, when you're having the conversation with them, you're not not paying regard to what's important to you, of course you are, but you also need to keep right at the front of your mind what's in it for your applicant, what are they looking for, and what bits of your job or what bits of the business um, can you tweak to actually make it more attractive to them. Uh, talk about your values in a meaningful way. You've really covered that one off, Murray Claire. Thank you very much. And then demonstrating your values authentically again, Asantha, thanks for your contribution on that. I think, you know, that um, being you, and recognizing that sometimes who you are is gonna put people off and that's okay. It's actually valid for them to be put off early in the rec recruitment and selection process. Uh, much worse if you pretend to be something you're not and they end up in your business and then three months later, just after the 90 day trial period, you're looking each other in the eye and going, it ain't gonna work, but it's starting to get a little bit harder to get out of that relationship. Uh, and there you go, there was my little bullet point, an appropriate bullet point uh, from before. So super important really just in that recruitment process to be you and accept that it's okay to be you, particularly in small businesses, um, being you. I just wanted to pick up on one of those points actually, and maybe Santa could talk to it too. That was a good point you made around so we're talking about anchoring all of this around the business owner in a small business. You know, that's obviously their values that's that's being um, resonated, but also then the tension between not hiring clones that and that, you know, people that aren't like you is very important. Like a diverse workforce is important. So how do you reconcile those two things then? And I know when Asantha interviewed me, it was an explicit question around like diversity here really matters. Explain to us you know the different experiences and backgrounds and things that you bring we we talk through that even an interview process so it's it's vital to pay sources and um approach but yeah any thoughts team on that i'm not sure if, i'm not sure if that's directed to something on me you go yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. but you yeah, know you, you, you uh, don't close uh, uh, the, the benefit of avoiding the clones, you know, uh, through my work experience in the number of businesses I've been involved in, in, in having people that, are, that, that don't think like you, that think differently, brings such an important uh, contribution to the business uh, in terms of changing the way you think or looking at it from different, different eyes. And, and, and so when we talked about the authenticity uh, and the, the, of being who you are, um, when we are who we are, we then give permission to the person we are interviewing or we're talking to to be themselves as well. Because you don't want them, you don't want to be faked in by them either. You 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 want to create an atmosphere that we can actually just be ourselves. And 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 I think that's one of the the biggest challenges that we've had, and that's the transition that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years, is that you know, we don't have to put on a, a fake suit and, and a suit of armor to go to work and pretend to be something that we are not. We, we've, we've stopped playing that game. And, 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 and it's, it's so liberating to, to just be who we are on, on both sides. And it's far more productive. Um, and, and, and it's a much nicer working environment because, you know, if you imagine that this person is going to transform into something else when they walk in, it, it is, is the fallacy. 
Yeah, and and uh, I can just see there's a new question posted. How do you balance hiring for fit and valuing diversity? And for me, the answer on that sits in value. So if you've got real clarity about what your business's values are, then it's anybody from any diverse background, if they share those values, is gonna is gonna be a good fit for your business. So you know, it's uh, I, I think it's really easy, and um, some of your words really ring true. Is that sometimes you know when we think about values consistency, we translate that into people are like me, so they have a similar background to me. They come from a similar kind of you know ethnicity, or they come from a similar socioeconomic background. And, and, and I want us to really get rid of that and actually kind of go, so if we can really talk to our values. So if we think about the values that um, that you talked about before, Marie Claire, about get shit done, have fun doing it, and surprise and delight, those values absolutely will speak to a diverse population and will attract a diversity into your workforce. So that it's the onus is on the hiring person to make sure that they're not confusing um diversity with values split those two I, things out. I, I, like, I like to add something to that so in, in our experience we are now 40 plus people here we 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 never set out to say we need a bald sri lankan we need you know one of these and, and two of those we never did that but when you look at the 40 people here we are you couldn't find a a, a more diverse group of people we didn't set out with that but that's what we've ended up with because the, the kind of people we attracted, we, they've had the talents and the skills and they bought into the vision that we had or of the business that we are creating. So, so it, I think that's one of the traps to fall into. They think they've got to be deliberately diverse and, 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 and I don't think that's the way to go. It, it just happens if you are open to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. And then if we just move on to my last slide, because I, I Totally accept that I'm probably getting very boring now, but I just wanted to touch on this first 90 days because the first 90 does make or break the psych what we call a psychological contract within the employment relationship. So it, it kind of almost never gets better than day one because at day one, neither the employer or the employee has disappointed the other, right? So the race in the first 90 days is for everybody to bank enough positive collateral in the relationship. So it's really important that as an employee in that first 90 days, you know, you show up and you're giving and doing your best. And as an employer, you're showing up and giving and doing your best because that 90 days then cements the rest of the relationship. So back to values, this is where the rubber hits the road. If you are not authentic in what you said through the selection process, then it's going to start to show up here and it's going to start to get a little uncomfortable. Um, so make sure that the values are, are being lived. You need to make sure the onboarding systems are seamless. So you've got good systems and processes. So once again, you know, if people feel like they're joining a smart business, then they're not on, you know, they're not getting their first pay three days late. They're not finding out that actually, you know, the manager, when they said that they're always on time to meetings is actually on time is anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes late. And that's how we roll. So, you know, it's absolutely important that those, the, the seamless stuff kind of gets put on. And then critical incidents you know what happens when the first thing goes wrong because it will go wrong so let's be really clear is because we're dealing with humans and humans are imperfect beings even all of us sitting on this call are imperfect beings hard to admit but something will go wrong somewhere and it's how you manage those first critical incidents and if they're managed in line with the rhetoric and the authenticity that you presented through the hiring process so when the first thing goes wrong when the first time you attempted to go bloody hell did they really do that think really hard about how you're going to manage that critical incident, what's the feedback process, how you're going to embrace the mistake and treat it as a learning opportunity if that's one of your values, how you're going to help them grow and develop through that, how you're going to hold up the mirror and think, what do I need to learn from this, either as a business or as a leader in my business? That critical incident and how you manage it, those first couple are absolutely key. 
Um, and then, you know, team versus leadership. This this point for me was just about, you know, what's actually happening in the team. It circles back to what Mario Claire was talking about before, is what's actually happening in the team versus what you think as a leadership team might be happening. And, um, you know, businesses get caught by this all the time. You will get caught. You can't avoid getting caught because move in relationships really quickly and it's really important to have those moments where you check in with the team and you are prepared to hear the bad stuff and you are prepared to say this is what I'm going to do to make it better um, and when you do that just just ask for one or two things so you know don't leave this for a year and do a staff survey and come up with 25 things that you need to do differently as a leader ask it once a week and once a week, come up with one thing that you can then habit stack on top of each other and you can become a better leader as you learn from your experiences. That's me, Santa. I think I'm handing over to you as our great leader in pay source. <laughs> and, and I think this is where you confess to all the things you've done wrong. I think that's the session <laughs> we're in now. Cool. Hey, uh, thanks, Lee. Yeah, I was going to share a couple of things that have helped me in in my journey of um, of, of having to lead people. Um, one was the first manager I ever had at Ernst & Young, uh, and that was an incredible learning experience. And, and he said, look, um, we work to certain deadlines and we work to achieving certain results. Now, if you can achieve the result at the same quality in a time earlier than that, and then you choose to take a day off, I don't mind that. And, and as, a, as a 19 year old, having that freedom, but more importantly, having someone trust me to deliver that and, and leaving me to do that made a, a significant impact on me and, and, and how I've approached uh, how I lead people. Um, the second was my first job in New Zealand. I, I worked for a company that had the, the most caustic sort of environment in how they treated people. And, and, and so, that was the realization that I had that that business is really about people and 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 that's it so like Richard Branson talks about take care of your employees and they'll take care of your customers is so true and, and so I made a promise to myself that if I meet a ex-employee or a current employee I'm delighted to see them I'm proud to say I work for this place because I've been on the other side like when someone said where did you work I was so embarrassed to say I worked at this organization was a was a very strong lesson I learned. Um, and, and the third, in terms of flexibility, um, in, 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 in my last business, um, we had a situation where there was a young woman and she was having her, her first child. And, and she said, look, I, I want to spend time with my baby, so I'm not going to be able to come to work. And, and, and she was a valuable team member. Together, we worked out that we actually got to a result where she was able to bring the baby to work and, and, and that was the most amazing thing. We watched this child grow up. We saw the child take its first steps. And, and you know, people said, like, but it'll create a disturbance. It'll, it was not. You couldn't have had a more productive employee than Rachel who, who, who put her all because she had the freedom. And, and yes, sure, there were times that she had to go home early uh, because the child was restless. She was very, very considerate about things like that. And, and, and that's the thing about employ team members will live up to the expectations that you have of them and and, and that's again a, a thing that I've discovered um, as we as we've built businesses um, so it, it's it's the ability for because we've got this idea that you know our life at home is different to our life at work it's not and and, and you know if you google what's the what's the top areas of work stress, you will get a list of things that happen at work, but that's not true. If you're, if you're behind on your mortgage payments at home and, and, and you can't put food on the table and you're going to work, the, 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 biggest stress, the biggest stress factor is that you're under financial duress. And, and, and that was one of the things that led us to do what is called pay now. Uh, because we 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 discovered that somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of all people who are employed, these are people who are earning money, are actually working poor. So if they can manage from pay to paycheck to paycheck if nothing goes wrong. If something goes wrong in that pay period, a car breaks down, a child gets sick, then they're unable to meet that need, 
And, and so we, 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 we provided the pay now feature to look after the mental health or take into consideration the mental health of an employee who's facing that situation. Um, we've now done over $3 million of, of pay now. Um, and, 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 and that has been a really beneficial tool for an employee, for an employer to offer this as an employment benefit that where, you know, if you get stuck, you don't have to be embarrassed about asking me as the employer. Because think about this. If someone's going through that kind of stress and they were working for your company, are they going to be doing the best for our customers? Uh, you know, if you are so stressed with financial stuff, would they be the most trustworthy? But what would they, sometimes they get pushed into a, a, a really bad situation that might be, might lead them to do something that's not in their character. So, you know, it's, it's about understanding some of those issues about the whole person who comes to work and saying, what can we do as employers to, to provide uh, some benefit? I, I get pushback for, for, for this of saying, look, you know, we shouldn't be involved in their personal affairs. Nah, we, we already are, you know, they're, they're already in the workplace and, and, and we do have to take some responsibility for their mental health. We are obliged to do that and, and, and provide um, whatever tools we can to help because shit happens in life and, and it's, it's like what what do we do in those situations to deal with that and 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 assist that person because they don't leave that at home they bring it to work so whether you like it or not it's already there so whatever you can do from a practical point of view does add significant value and and then you've got an engaged employee working in your environment giving them giving your customers and that business the best so that, those, are, those are some of the things that, 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 that I was keen to talk about. Um, I think there was a specific question that someone had raised around the, um, the difference between a manager and coach. And, and, and that's a, it's a, a really th grateful for, for asking that. Um, because a, a lot of, our, you know, in the past, you know, I've been guilty of this as well, is that it's about being managing the tasks, managing the person, as opposed to coaching someone through of how, how to give them their best. So I made a note of, of the things is, first, I need to know the person. I need to know the whole person. Who are they? What's going on in their life? What are they interested in? You know, what, what, what excites them? And, and again, and that again fits back to why they join the business. We've been privileged to have people come and work for us because they want to. You know, and, and I think the, out of the last five or six hires, Two have just walked in and said, look, we really like what you're doing. We want to be part of your story. Um, and that was not about, it was not about the salary we could pay them or the benefits thing. It's about being part of the journey that we are on in, from a tech point of view. So it's about knowing, knowing the person. Um, second is help with career. So we, we, we are really proud that we hire people from Summer of Tech. Um, we've had a, um, and, and out of that, you know, we've got to a point that we've grown a person to uh, to an, a level of ability that they can then take that skill set and, and go somewhere else. And and I'm delighted that we were able to do that. So we help someone with their career path that would have been stymied if they stayed on with us. That they're doing something and, and they look back and they think that they helped me to get there. Five years time, they might come back and 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 take on a, a senior position. In it. So it's about keeping that door open. Transparency. Um, so as, as a coach, it's, it's about being, being prepared to be transparent about the business, about, um, about yourself, about making yourself vulnerable. And, and, and I think that's something that we, you know, to be able to sort of share what's going on in, in our lives as a coach, then you can connect with that person. And I think that that's important. And, and, and the last one, which um, I think, you know, um, both of you talked about is what happens when things go wrong? And, and, and that, that is a, because things always will go wrong at some point in time. How you behave in that, whether you, know, you take this as, you know, issue a, a stern warning or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, what, what do you do when things go wrong is a, a really, really important thing for us to take a deep breath and say, like, how am I going to react to this? How, how, what can we learn from, learn from this? And, you know, it's, um, there should be an ad in Wellington. It's the putting right that counts. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not trying to prevent the mistake. It's about how do we fix it from here. Um, it, so that's, 
that that's the difference between a coach and a manager in 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 my perspective um and, and i think th there's a change in the environment Pe people want you know people want that it, it's 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 not the, the the good old days like it used to be it, it's people expect to be treated properly with respect with dignity and and, and i think as employers we, we owe it to the, the people who are giving of themselves to, to serve our customers and the business. It's become much less transactional and much more holistic yeah. relationship. Yeah. Um, so if we've talked about being a better boss and, and you know, we've talked through quite a lot of processes and systems and, and ideas for that, but what about the sort of internal things that we need to be as good bosses? Like, so how do you make sure you can be the best boss you are? What, how do, what's your tips for other leaders in terms of taking as much care of yourself as you do of your employees? Like your own, our own personal well-being as leaders is critical to be a great boss, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's we 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 tend to put ourselves last and 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 you know i look and say look what what's missing um from from my um set of tools that i have you know where can i upskill myself where can i learn and and you know it, it's 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 listening to podcasts coming to things like this it, it, and hearing what other people have done in, in in that situation uh is a really valuable thing and and it's a it's a like i i have set aside mondays as my thinking day so that that gives me I'm not in the I'm not in the office. I'm, I'm out of the office, and and that allows me the time and the freedom to see things from a different perspective when I walk in on Tuesday, because that's a conscious break that that I'll deal with, you know, things that help me be a better better boss, um, a better employer. Is it, time that I, that I invest in that. The one other thing, that I, like it's, it's an experience from today. I'm, I'm dealing with the situation um, of an employee that you know we're looking at saying that why isn't that person the best person they are and 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 so I've moved my desk I'm sitting with that person alongside that person listening in and 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 helping and, and being there on the floor to understand what they're dealing with and, and what can we do differently and 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 that and so important because the insights I've had over the last four hours it has been invaluable I, I I really understand what's going on now, which I wouldn't have had that if I was in my office and, and trying to understand what the hell's going on. It, it's being, being on the floor beats everything else. Just had another question just pop up. Let's have a quick look. Um, thank you. I need to reset our story and expectations with my team. What are some tips to help do this well with existing employees? It's about a reset. Yeah, uh, I, can I can jump in for a start on that. So um, the first thing to do is listen. The mm. very first thing to do is listen. Um, so if you think you need a reset, then they already know you need a reset. So there's nothing that you know that they don't already know. So the first thing to do is actually sit down I always like to break bread because I'm a fan of anything that's got, you know, added calories. And, uh, and, and you know, food makes people, the conversation flow a little bit easier. Um, and, and, and go in with the mindset of listening. So really think about what are some of the questions that you could ask that might get the conversation going. And when they greet you with a silence, wait it out until somebody starts talking really let them tell their stories i'm out on that one that was my first <laughs> helpful part. You guys can, i don't know where you take it from there <laughs> yeah, i'm listen, just for, for me it's 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 honesty right so so you know we, we've got to a point where things are not working out so so let's acknowledge that and, and say look you know hell you know the the last six weeks six months six years has been less than ideal we, we are not enjoying this how do we make a change mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 that honest genuinely honest um conversation will provide the answers will come you know and 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 you've got to trust that process is that you've got to create the space for for people to to open up and say look you know it's because xyz and and, and then you can work through some of those things and 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 then what comes then act on that and there's nothing more depressing than saying, look, things have been bad. We sit down and talk about it. And then tomorrow 
it's the same all again. If, if there's no change, then you, you've lost it. And through that listening process, then you're creating a collaborative approach to putting it right too, right? which is much better than a trying to feel it, that loneliness that comes with thinking that it's them and us, that it's me and them, whereas you're actually, your team are your team, they're part of your team and you're one member of that team. So um, you can lean on them too. Yeah, and I think that can be really liberating um, if yeah. we just shift our mindset as leaders from we have to have the answers to we simply facilitating the answers from the, the from the collective, and um, and and I I think that we underestimate how liberating uh, and how anxiety lifting that can be for <laughs> us as leaders when we let go of that. Yeah, but you don't know. We we don't have all the answers. No, I know, but it takes us a while to work out. We don't have all the answers. <laughs> and, and it's something we have to keep relearning. I'm super conscious that we're getting to the end of our hour. So um, for those who will have to jump to their one o'clock meetings, um, any more questions, you're very welcome to ask. Otherwise, I really enjoyed this conversation. Mm -hmm. I would say, please feel free to link in, find us on LinkedIn and catch up with us. If you want to carry on the conversation, you want to ask us any more questions, we're there, we'd love to love to talk more and LinkedIn's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, come and check out paysource.com to find out more about pay now, of course. Um, and thank you to everyone for being here today. Thank you for the questions that came in. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to put this content together and have a really good think about it. I've really enjoyed um, the process of putting it together and working with you, Lee and Asantha, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care, everyone. Right. Have a good day. Thanks, Mary Claire. Bye. Bye.